Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is power factor and efficiency in AC circuits. Our objective is to explore the significance of power factor and efficiency in AC circuits, as well as compare and contrast these two properties with one another. If you've been following the AC circuit analysis playlist in its intended sequence, you'll recall that I've sprinkled several examples of power factor and efficiency throughout the previous lectures, notably the AC power examples, power in series AC circuits, and power in parallel AC circuits, all available at the Big Bad Tech channel. While not necessarily extremely difficult topics, it's perhaps worth at least a moment of our time to specifically focus our attention solely on power factor and efficiency in and of themselves without the distraction of a larger lecture. Bottom line up front, power factor is not efficiency and efficiency is not power factor. This being said, they are related topics and I hope to define these properties and draw clear boundaries around their individual spheres of influence and in which areas there is some overlap. Let's examine power factor first. Power factor is calculated using several different methods. Numerically, power factor is the ratio of real power in units of watts over apparent power in units of volt amperes. Additionally, power factor is the cosine of the apparent power angle. Given we are aware that apparent power is in fact not just a magnitude, but rather a complex number with both real and reactive dimensions, power factor is in effect a pre-calculated cheat code that extracts the real power component from apparent power, where real power is the apparent power times power factor. Real power is that amount of power that can actually be put to work, either heating, lifting, lowering, grinding, crushing, or moving something. What might not be obvious is that by extracting the real dimension from apparent power, power factor essentially strips apparent power of the reactive power dimension. Reactive power, measured in units of VARs, is that amount of power cyclically absorbed and returned or exchanged through the source. Reactive power, while an important property for magnetic loads like motors and transformers, doesn't actually get put to work. This is where it's helpful to think of power factor as a filter through which apparent power must pass. Power factor basically lets real power pass through and strips apparent power of the reactive dimension. Volt amperes of apparent power go in and watts of real power come out. Vars of reactive power are removed from consideration. Power factor is ordinarily expressed as a decimal number, although sometimes is expressed as a percentage. Additionally, power factor has a flavor, either capacitive or inductive. Capacitive occasions in which current leads voltage are sometimes referred to as having a leading power factor, whereas inductive occasions in which current lags voltage are sometimes referred to as having a lagging power factor. This being said, most real-world power factor analysis scenarios involve motors, which unless explicitly stated otherwise, are ordinarily always assumed to have a lagging power factor. This default flavor often goes unstated on a motor nameplate. Finally, it should be noted that power factor can be at maximum a 1 and at minimum a 0, either leading or lagging. A power factor of 1, or unity, implies current is perfectly in phase with voltage and all of apparent power is directed towards real power and none of it towards a reactive interchange. At the opposite end of the spectrum, a power factor of 0 implies current either leads or lags voltage by a full 90 degrees and no apparent power is directed towards real power because all of it is being directed towards a reactive interchange. Let's now examine efficiency. This might be a review given your previous experience with efficiency during the DC circuit analysis playlist. Really the only complication that AC circuit analysis brings to the table in regards to efficiency is that apparent power can be considered as having both real and reactive dimensions. Efficiency concerns itself with real power only. In summary, Efficiency is a measurement of how much real power input to a system is put to beneficial use. Efficiency is calculated as the ratio of usable power out over power in and is typically expressed as a percentage. Efficiency is a very slippery fish to hold because each system defines efficiency differently depending upon its goals and intended purpose. Consider a heater with the intended purpose of heating up a vat full of some liquid. In this application, Heat is the desired output and considered a beneficial use of power. In this application, there might be little, if any, losses since electrical power is readily converted into heat. Consider, however, motor being used to pump the heated liquid into or out of the tank. In this application, mechanical power in the form of rotational speed and the twisting force known as torque 
is considered a beneficial use of power, and any heat produced by the motor windings would now be considered a loss. The motor's intended purpose is to not heat the liquid, but rather pump it into or out of the tank. Long story short, efficiency depends upon how one defines the system's inputs, outputs, and the intended purpose. This is where it's again helpful to think of efficiency as a filter through which real power input to a system must pass. Efficiency basically lets usable real power pass through and strips input real power of losses. Additionally, efficiency can also be conceptualized as a cascaded system where each stage hands off a portion of usable power to the next. Consider a motor not directly driving a process, but rather indirectly driving it through a gearbox intermediary where there exists a degree of misalignment between the shaft, friction in the bearings, or backlash between the gear teeth. Conceptualized in this fashion, there is an amount of real power initially input to this system of which electrical efficiency reduces the usable power because of losses in the form of heat. From this stage's output, mechanical efficiency further reduces the usable power output because of additional mechanical losses in the form of heat, friction, and or noise. A multi-stage system can also be packaged as one larger system where the efficiency of the larger system is the product of the efficiency ratings of each stage. It should be noted that the efficiency of a cascaded system is always less than the least efficient stage. If the system's electrical efficiency was 85% efficient and the system's mechanical efficiency was 75% efficient, the entire cascaded system's efficiency would be 85% times 75% or roughly 63.8% efficient. Finally, it should be noted that efficiency can be at maximum 100% but only in extremely rare occasions. Ordinarily, there is always some degree of loss, although at times these losses may be considered negligible. Long story short, given losses always occur, it always takes more input power to yield a desired output power. If you ever find power output to be greater than power input, you need to immediately stop what you're doing and patent that idea or seek reassessment of your data because it's violating fundamental properties of the observable universe. Because efficiency is such a slippery fish to hold, you'll often hear wild claims of free energy, especially in the stupider corners of the internet, often associated with terms government conspiracy, suppressed science, or alien technology. But trust me, these are outright falsehoods or there are deceptive games being played. You can't get something for nothing. Now that we've established pretty clear definitions of both power factor and efficiency, let's compare and contrast the two. Let's start with the similarities between the two properties. Power factor strips apparent power of reactive power and leaves only real power. Similarly, efficiency strips real power input to a system of losses and leaves only usable real power output. In this sense, both power factor and efficiency can be considered as filters, letting some desirable quantity through and excluding some undesirable property from consideration. Given the similar function of these two properties, it's often best to conceptualize the interaction of power factor and efficiency as subsequent hoops through which apparent power must jump to yield usable real power output. If apparent power is to be considered the theoretical maximum in which there is no phase shift between voltage and current and all power is assumed to be positive, power factor is the first hoop through which apparent power must jump to yield real electrical power delivered to that device. Reactive power, while an important dimension of apparent power and undoubtedly essential to the operation of devices like motors and transformers, both of which require a magnetic field to operate, is excluded from consideration by this first power factor hoop. Efficiency, the second hoop, shaves off all real power losses like heat, friction, and noise from the real electrical power input and yields real power output. Depending upon how you define a cascaded system, each stage's output may or may not have to jump through additional efficiency hoops to yield usable power output. It should be noted that this simple model may necessitate rearrangement of the hoops or inclusion of other hoops depending upon your perspective. I'll clarify this with some examples before we close out this lecture. Speaking of examples, let's try an illustrated example. Consider a system known to consume one kilovolt ampere of apparent power. It has a lagging power factor of 0.9 and an efficiency of 90%. Note, despite the similar ratings, power factor is not efficiency, 
and efficiency is not power factor. Jumping through the 0.9 lagging power factor hoop, one kilovolt ampere of apparent power yields 900 watts of real electrical power input to this system. The 435.9 bars of reactive power, while essential to this system's operation, is excluded from consideration by power factor. When 900 watts of real input power jumps through the 90% efficiency hoop, it yields 810 watts of usable power output, where 90 watts have been lost to heat, friction, or noise. In summary, one kilovolt ampere of apparent power comes in and 810 watts of usable power comes out. This chain of calculations should be relatively self-explanatory. Let's now examine the differences between power factor and efficiency. First, power factor concerns itself with both apparent and real power. In contrast, efficiency concerns itself solely with real power transfer through a larger system. Additionally, there is a stark difference between the numerical calculation of power factor and efficiency. Given this example system has a 90% efficiency rating, also implicitly implies that this system is 10% inefficient. Power in must equal power out. This implies that all power must go somewhere, and if it's not usable, it's considered a loss. Given 900 watts of real power is input to this 90% efficient system, 0.9 times 900, or 810 watts, goes to usable power, and 0.1 times 900, or 90 watts, is considered a loss. No such linearity exists with power factor. Recall that apparent power is a complex number consisting of both real and reactive dimensions. Yes, a lagging power factor of 0.9 implies that 0.9 of 1 kilovolt ampere, or 900 watts, is input to this system, but it most assuredly does not imply that 0.1 of 1 kilovolt ampere, or 100 VARs, goes towards a reactive interchange. Long story short, real and reactive power do have a give-and-take relationship, but it's not linear. Recall that real power in units of watts is apparent power times the cosine of the apparent power angle. Reactive power in units of VARs, in contrast, is apparent power times the sine of the apparent power angle. If one knows the power factor, one can calculate the apparent power angle by taking the inverse cosine of power factor. This angle can then be used to calculate reactive power. For this particular example, the inverse cosine of 0.9 is an apparent power angle of roughly 25.8 degrees. The angle is assumed to be positive because we're clearly dealing with an inductive occasion which current lags voltage and inductive reactive power is assumed to be positive. Substituting in our given values yields not 100, but rather 435.9 VARs. As a follow-on exercise, consider how power factor and efficiency not only influence each other, but also the final result. For the second iteration, let's say power factor remains 0.9 and efficiency is increased to 95%. If this system continues to consume 1 kVA of apparent power, jumping through the power factor hoop, the input real electrical power is 900 watts as previously. The 435.9 VARs of reactive power while essential to this system's operation is excluded from consideration by power factor. When real power jumps through the increased efficiency hoop, it yields 855 watts of usable power output, where only 45 watts have been lost to heat, friction, or noise. Compare and contrast this implementation with our previous one. The same amount of real power went into the system, but more of it came out because it was used more efficiently. Let's come at this from a different direction this time, increasing power factor to 0.95 and keeping efficiency at 90%. If this system continues to consume 1 kVA of apparent power, jumping through the power factor hoop, 1 kVA of apparent power yields an increased real power input of 950 watts. Taking the inverse cosine of power factor demonstrates the apparent power angle is 18.2 degrees. The 312.2 VARs of reactive power while essential to this system's operation, is excluded from consideration by power factor. When real power jumps through the efficiency hoop, it also yields 855 watts of usable power output, only this time an increased amount of 95 watts have been lost to heat, friction, and or noise. Let's compare and contrast these three implementations with one another. For our third implementation, an increased power factor of 0.95 resulted in not only more real power input into this system, but also less reactive. This being said, 
Given efficiency remained at 90%, the third implementation used the increased amount of real power input as wisely as the first. However, given the system had more real power input to it in the first place, it resulted in the same amount of output power as the second implementation. Additionally note, the third implementation resulted in more losses, in this case, 95 watts, more than double the losses of the second implementation. This implies that the third implementation might require a more robust, i.e. heavier and more expensive frame or heat exchanger to dissipate these increased losses. Again, all power has to go somewhere, even if its destination is considered a loss. One cannot expect even a 99.9% .9 efficient gearbox designed to handle 2 megawatts of power to be made out of tissue paper and compressed cheese. 0.1% losses of 2 megawatts is still 2 kilowatts, or 2,000 watts, and this 2,000 watts needs to go somewhere via a sufficiently robust channel. Now that we've got a pretty clear understanding of power factor and efficiency, let's put your understanding of these properties to the test with this series of illustrated example problems. For each scenario, use the given data to fill in the missing information. Some of these scenarios may take some thought and effort on your part. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Our first illustrated example problem features a system consuming 2 megavolt amperes of apparent power at a lagging power factor of 0.8, driving a 75% efficient system. We're being asked to solve for real power, reactive power, losses, and usable power output by this system. This is pretty easy considering it's a direct repeat of our previous examples. A power factor of 0.8 implies an apparent power angle of roughly 36.9 degrees. This implies power factor excludes approximately 1.2 megavars of reactive power from consideration, meaning only 1.6 megawatts of real power is considered input. Of this 1.6 megawatts of input power, the 75% efficient system outputs only 1.2 megawatts of power considered usable and 0.4 megawatts or 400 kilowatts is considered a loss. Our second illustrated example features a two-stage system producing two horsepower of usable power. The first stage of the system is known to be 75% efficient, and the second stage of the system is known to be 85% efficient. Additionally, we're aware the system has a lagging power factor of 0.84. We're being asked to solve for the apparent power, the real power, the reactive power, the losses in stage 1, the usable power output of stage 1, which coincidentally is the power input to stage 2, and finally the losses in stage 2. This is essentially the same problem as previously, only it uses two stages and it's being done in reverse. First, we need to do a unit conversion. 2 horsepower is equivalent to 1,492 watts. Given 1,492 watts of usable power is coming out of the second 85% efficient system, means 1,492 divided by 0.85, or 1,755.3, or roughly 1 1.8 kilowatts of power was input to it, and approximately 263.3 watts is considered a loss. Power input to this stage is greater than the power output, not the other way around. Similarly, 1,755.3 watts of usable power output is coming out of the first 75% efficient system, means roughly 2,340.4, or approximately 2.3 kilowatts of real power was input to it, and approximately 585.1 watts is considered a loss. Again, power input is greater than power output, not the other way around. Given 2,340.4 watts of real power is being input to this two-stage system with a lagging power factor of 0.84, means the system is consuming 2,786.2 volt amperes, or roughly 2.8 kilovolt amperes of apparent power, of which 1,511.7, or approximately 1.5 kilobars of reactive power is excluded from consideration. Finally, our third illustrated example problem features a system known to produce 400 watts of usable power. We're additionally aware that the system is consuming 600 volt amperes of apparent power and positive 250 vars of reactive power. We're being asked to solve for power factor, efficiency, real power input, and losses. This isn't a complete setup as were the two previous example problems and might have necessitated some thought and effort on your part. Given reactive power is apparent power times the sine of the apparent power angle, we can rearrange this equation to solve for the apparent power angle. 
where the apparent power angle is the inverse sine of reactive power over apparent power. Substituting in our given values yields an apparent power angle of 24.6 degrees. Given the cosine of the apparent power angle is power factor, we can substitute our given values to solve for power factor. Cosine of 24.6 degrees yields a power factor of roughly 0.91. Given a known apparent power figure and a known power factor, we can solve for real power, where real power equals apparent power times power factor. Substituting in our given values yields a real power input of 545.4 watts. Given 400 watts of real power output implies this system has a 400 over 545.4 or approximately 73.4% efficiency and approximately 145.4 watts of power is considered a loss. Alright, hopefully you did well in that example set. Let's now examine some of the special case scenarios that may complicate our understanding of power factor and efficiency. Really, complications only come into play when one plays fast and loose with the definitions and boundaries of where one system begins and another ends. As a preparatory exercise for this discussion, Consider the following AC circuit consisting of a 10 ohm resistor in series with a second element that happens to have an impedance of 65 ohms at an angle of 30 degrees at the given excitation frequency. The supply voltage is a magnitude of 120 volts. As an exercise to the viewer, I invite you to calculate the voltage across each element, the current through each element, the apparent, real, and reactive power for each element, as well as the source current and the total apparent, real, and reactive power for the whole circuit. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The series combination of these two impedances presents a total impedance of approximately 73.8 ohms at an angle of 26.1 degrees. Ohm's law demonstrates this combination of impedance elements will draw roughly 1.6 amps of current at an angle of negative 26.1 degrees. Given this is a series circuit, it can be said that source current equals the current through element 1, which equals the current through element 2. Another implementation of Ohm's law demonstrates that the voltage drop across the 10 ohm resistor will be approximately 16.3 volts at an angle of negative 26.1 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current through the 10 ohm resistor is perfectly in phase with the voltage across it. Apparent power delivered to the 10 ohm resistor is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting our given values, yields an apparent power figure of 26.4 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates this first impedance is directing 26.4 watts towards real power and zero vars towards a reactive interchange. Yet another implementation of Ohm's law demonstrates that the voltage drop across the second impedance will be approximately 105.6 volts at an angle of 3.9 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current through the second impedance lags voltage across it by 30 degrees. Apparent power delivered to the second impedance is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, yields an apparent power figure of 171.7 volt amperes at an angle of 30 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates this impedance is directing 148.7 watts towards real power and 85.9 vars towards a reactive interchange. Coming at this from the total circuit perspective, it can be said source current lags supply voltage by 26.1 degrees. Total apparent power delivered to this system is the complex conjugate of supply voltage times source current. Substituting in our given values yields a total apparent power figure of 195.0 volt amperes at an angle of 26.1 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates this total circuit is directing 175.1 watts towards real power and 85.9 bars towards a reactive interchange. As can be expected, total apparent power is a summation of individual apparent powers and total real power is a summation of individual real powers, and finally, total reactive power is a summation of individual reactive powers. Realize these voltage, current, and power figures are correct and will remain correct regardless of any perspective employed. Power factor and efficiency, however, might be open to interpretation. For example, consider this whole system as just some theoretical exercise in which no actual work is being done. For this scenario, we don't really have to worry about efficiency. On a whole system level, it can be said of the 195 volt amperes put into this system, 175.1 watts of real power is observed. Using this whole system perspective, it can be said the complete circuit 
has a lagging power factor of 175.1 over 195, or approximately 0.9 lagging. Note the inverse cosine of 26.1 degrees is approximately 0.9. This power factor figure is true when considering this complete circuit. If, however, we consider the power factor for each impedance individually, we arrive at different power factor figures. Of the 26.4 volt amperes of apparent power delivered to the 10 ohm resistor, 26.4 watts is directed towards real power and voltage is in phase with current. It can be said that the 10 ohm resistor has a power factor of 1 or unity, meaning current neither leads nor lags voltage. Similarly, of the 171.7 volt amperes of apparent power delivered to the second impedance, 148.7 watts is directed towards real power and current lags voltage by a relative 30 degrees. It can be said the second impedance has a lagging power factor of roughly 0.87. These power factor figures are also true when considering each impedance individually. Let's now examine efficiency. If we consider this system not as some theoretical abstraction, but rather as a practical application of electrical power delivery and use, we can explore the effects of losses in this system. For example, if we consider the second impedance, to not be just some passive combination of resistive and inductive elements that happens to have an impedance of 65 ohms at an angle of 30 degrees at the given excitation frequency, but rather as the intended destination of electrical power, we can explore the efficiency of real power transfer within this system. In this scenario, we're assuming the 10 ohm resistor in series is simply the means of transferring power from the source to our load, and our second impedance might be the winding of a motor performing some industrial task. Often motor windings are modeled as combinations of resistive and inductive elements. With this new understanding of this larger system, any real power dissipated by the 10 ohm resistor, our means of transferring power, is now considered a loss, whereas any real power dissipated by the second impedance, our electrical load and intended destination, is considered beneficial use. Using this definition, of the 175.1 watts of real power supplied to this system, the electrical load receives 148.7 watts, meaning this system is roughly 85% efficient. Additionally, this implies the system is also roughly 15% inefficient, meaning the 26.4 watts dissipated by the 10 ohm resistor in series is considered a loss. In summary, for both power factor and efficiency calculations, one needs to have clear direction regarding the intended destination of power and what actually constitutes beneficial use or loss. Before we close out this lecture, let's consider a rather surprising interaction between power factor and efficiency. As we've discussed, power factor concerns itself solely with the conversion of apparent to real power, and efficiency concerns itself solely with the transfer of real power throughout the system. Can power factor affect other properties as well and can those other properties indirectly affect efficiency? Yes, yes they can. As a preliminary discussion about power factor correction, an upcoming topic in the AC circuit analysis playlist, consider a 120 volt source and an electrical load modeled as an impedance of 80 ohms at an angle of 40 degrees. Note in this application, we've eliminated the means of transmitting power from the source to the load. As such, any power produced by the source is received by the load. As preparation for this preliminary discussion about power factor correction, see if you can solve for the voltage, current, apparent, real, and reactive power, as well as the power factor for the electrical load in the present configuration. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Ohm's law demonstrates current through the electrical load will be 1.5 amps at an angle of negative 40 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current through the electrical load lags voltage across it by 40 degrees. Apparent power delivered to the electrical load is a complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values yields an apparent power figure of 180 volt amperes at an angle of 40 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components, demonstrates the electrical load is directing 137.9 watts towards real power and 115.7 vars towards a reactive interchange. It can be said that the electrical load has a lagging power factor of roughly 0.77. Given there is a single electrical load in this system and no inefficient means of transmitting power from the source to the load, you might be under the somewhat false impression that this system is 100% efficient. 
when you're in a room watching a source supplying 137.9 watts of real power and a motor consuming the same amount of power, this 100% efficiency assumption might be correct. One only needs to walk outside to realize the error of this assumption. Power comes to this room from some distant generation facility via a means of transmission. Yes, at the point of use, our source does indeed appear to be 120 volts at an angle of zero degrees, and the losses from the plug to the motor inside the room are considered negligible, but outside the room, they most certainly are not. I'll deal with AC power transmission in greater detail in much later lectures, but as an extremely simplified example, consider the generation facility as some other source in series with a transmission line with a given impedance, in this case, modeled as a 5 ohm resistor. The magnitude of the generation facility source is such that it accounts for any voltage drop across the 5 ohm transmission line, and at the point of use, i.e. inside the room, it does indeed appear to be 120 volts at an angle of 0 degrees. That's really the job of the electrical utility, to manage the generating and transmission facilities such that there always appears to be a stable voltage source at the point of use. Given this expanded perspective, we're aware that the electrical load drawing 1.5 amps of current at an angle of negative 40 degrees also implies the 5 ohm transmission line carries 1.5 amps of current at an angle of negative 40 degrees. Because the transmission line is assumed to be purely resistive, we know our current will be in phase with the voltage across it. Since we're presently unaware of the generating facility voltage magnitude, nor the voltage drop across the transmission line, we can use an alternate version of the power formula to solve for losses in the transmission line. Apparent power consumed by the transmission line is the complex conjugate of current squared times impedance. Substituting in our given values, use an apparent power figure of 11.3 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the transmission line is directing 11.3 watts towards real power and zero vars towards a reactive interchange. Using this larger, more inclusive perspective, it can be said that the generating facility is delivering power to not one, but two loads. The generating facility must therefore be expected to produce 11.3 plus 137.9 or 149.1 watts of total real power. Given the electrical load is receiving only 137.9 watts of real power and the transmission line is dissipating 11.3 watts considered a loss, the efficiency of this larger system can be considered 137.9 over 149.1 or 92.5% efficient. My question to you is this, how can we improve the efficiency of this system if we can't change the source, we can't change the transmission line, and we can't change the electrical load? This is a seemingly impossible challenge given these restrictions, however, consider power factor correcting the system inside the room. Given capacitive and inductive reactive powers are essentially mirror images of one another, we might be able to add an equal and opposite amount of capacitive impedance to our electrical load internal to the room such that reactive power requirements external to the room cancel each other out. Ideally, we should be able to establish a scenario in which our electrical load receives the same amount of real power, yet draws less source current. Given less current, less power will be dissipated in the transmission line external to the room and this larger system will be more efficient as a result. Let's put these initial figures aside as a basis of comparison for the upcoming exercise. The process of power factor correction ordinarily involves the addition of a variable capacitor in parallel with a load that exhibits inductive characteristics. Given capacitors and inductors are essentially mirror images of one another in terms of electrical properties, by adjusting the capacitance of the power factor correcting capacitor, one can balance the system such that the negative reactive power supplied by the capacitor and the positive reactive power consumed by the inductive portion of the electrical load effectively cancel each other out. Given this balance condition, the capacitor and inductive portion of the electrical load simply exchange reactive power with each other internal to the circuit, and the source is freed from the responsibility of supplying reactive power. As a result, source current decreases and less power will be lost in the transmission system external to the room. 
let's first return to the confines of the room and examine how this might affect the performance of our given system. We'll examine power factor correction in greater detail in later lectures. For now, I'll do the heavy work and just say that our variable capacitor has been adjusted to approximately 21.3 microfarads. At our given excitation frequency of 60 Hz, the 21.3 microfarad power factor correcting capacitor would present an impedance of roughly 124.5 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Inside the room, the electrical load of the power factor correcting capacitor appear to be perfectly in parallel with a 120 volt source. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. This is the most fundamental property of parallel circuits. From the electrical load's perspective, nothing has changed because it's still perfectly in parallel with the 120 volt source. As previously, the load will continue to draw 1.5 amps of current at an angle of negative 40 degrees and apparent power delivered to the load would be 180 volt amperes at an angle of 40 degrees, of which 137.9 watts is directed towards real power and 115.7 bars is directed towards a reactive interchange. The addition of the power factor correcting capacitor in parallel, however, includes another path for source current. Kirchhoff's current law analysis of our present configuration, including the power factor correct capacitor, demonstrates that source current equals current to the load plus current to the power factor correcting capacitor. Ohm's law demonstrates current through the power factor correcting capacitor will be 964.2 milliamperes at an angle of 90 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current through the power factor correcting capacitor leads voltage across it by 90 degrees. Apparent power delivered to the power factor correcting capacitor is a complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values yields an apparent power figure of 115.7 volt amperes at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the power factor correcting capacitor is directing zero watts towards real power and negative 115.7 bars towards a reactive interchange. O M G the reactive power supplied by the power factor correcting capacitor is equal in magnitude yet of opposite polarity as that consumed by the inductive reactive portion of the electrical load. As we discussed, capacitors and inductors are essentially mirror images of one another. You'd think with an additional path in parallel, source current would increase, but closer inspection reveals something interesting. Look at the angles. Substituting our given current values into our previous Kirchhoff's current law analysis, yield source current has dropped in comparison to our original configuration, not including the power factor correcting capacitor. Source current shown to be roughly 1.15 amps at an angle of zero degrees. Not only has source current magnitude decreased and now appears to be in phase with supply voltage. We'll return to discuss the significance of these important observations in a moment. When we look at the system inside the room, total apparent power is a summation of apparent power delivered to the electrical load plus apparent power delivered to the power factor correcting capacitor. Substituting in our given values yields a total apparent power figure of 137.9 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Similarly, total real power is a summation of real power delivered to the electrical load plus real power delivered to the power factor correcting capacitor. Substituting in our given values, it's a total real power figure 137.9 watts. Finally, and this is important, total reactive power is a summation of reactive power delivered to the electrical load plus reactive power delivered to the power factor correcting capacitor. Substituting in our given values yields a total reactive power figure of zero vars. The equal and opposite reactive natures of the electrical load and the power factor correcting capacitor effectively cancel each other out. As a means of checking our work, Total apparent power is the complex conjugate of supply voltage times source current. Substituting in our given values, we again arrive at a total apparent power figure of 137.9 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. 137.9 watts of which is directed towards real power and zero vars of which is directed towards a reactive interchange. Is it really zero vars? No, no it's not. The inductive portion of the electrical load really is consuming positive 115.7 vars, then the power factor correcting capacitor really is supplying negative 115.7 vars. The deal is they're juggling reactive power back and forth with each other 
and the source stays out of it. That's the point. Power factor correction balances the circuit such that the source isn't supplying reactive power over a distance. As such, source current drops and appears to be in phase with the supply voltage. Power factor correction, if you think about it, is a cunning means of tricking a source into thinking it's providing only real power. Let's again return our attention to the facilities outside the room. As previously, let's assume the generation facility is some other source in series with the transmission line modeled as a 5 ohm resistor. The magnitude of the generation facility source is adjusted such that it accounts for any voltage drop across the 5 ohm transmission line and at the point of use, i.e. inside the room, it still appears to be a source with a magnitude of 120 volts. Conditions experienced by the electrical load and power factor correcting capacitor remain unchanged. Given this expanded perspective, we're aware that our power factor correcting capacitor and electrical load pair are drawing 1.15 amps at an angle of zero degrees. Also implies that our transmission line carries 1.15 amps at an angle of zero degrees. Again, because the transmission line is assumed to be purely resistive, we know current will be in phase with the voltage across it. Apparent power consumed by the transmission line is the complex conjugate of current squared times impedance. Substituting in our given values yields an apparent power figure of roughly 6.6 .6 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the transmission line is directing 6.6 .6 watts towards real power and zero vars towards the reactive interchange. Using this larger, more inclusive perspective, it could be said that the generating facility is producing 6.6 .6 watts plus 137.9 watts or 144.5 watts of total real power and zero vars of reactive power given the equal and opposite reactive interchange of positive and negative 115.7 vars is occurring internal to the circuit. Given the electrical load is receiving 137.9 watts of real power, and the transmission line is dissipating 6.6 .6 watts considered a loss to this system, the efficiency of this larger system is therefore 95.4%. Recall our previous circuit, not incorporating the power factor correcting capacitor, was only 92.5% efficient. In summary, by power factor correcting the system internal to the room and using a larger, more holistic perspective of how electrical power is generated, transmitted, and used, we increase the efficiency of this larger system. Perfectly power factor corrected systems exchange an equal and opposite amount of reactive power internal to the system, and as a result, draw less source current, yet still consume the same amount of real power. Is power factor correction totally awesome? Yes, it is, and we'll have ample opportunities to explore this most fascinating subject in the very near future. Until then, that's about it for now. Like I said, we'll examine power factor correction in greater detail in an upcoming lecture, but realize the tools to analyze these scenarios are already within your grasp. In conclusion, this lecture examined power factor and efficiency in AC circuits. We learned power factor concerns itself solely with the conversion of apparent to real power, and efficiency concerns itself solely with the transfer of real power through the system. Additionally, we examined scenarios in which there is a degree of overlap between power factor and efficiency, and how these properties can influence each other, as well as other circuit properties. Finally, we had a preliminary discussion about power factor correction. And remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank you.